You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coonhounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. All right, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. I'm Trevor Wade, the Coonhound Program Manager here at UKC, and I'm with our Director of Hunting Ops, Alan Gingrich. Uh, I just wanted to to say now we've got a couple of these in our back pockets now. We've we've been taping these uh, the past few weeks, and, um, and we actually some out for public consumption right now. We've got a lot of positive feedback so far. Yeah, and that that feels good. You know, it's kind of it's something new for us, and takes a little getting used to, but I think we're getting more comfortable with it. So hopefully they'll get better. Yeah, I can already tell that I'm more comfortable and you probably are too. And talking back and forth, it takes a little getting used to. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, So this is the second one that you've already knocked out today. I think you did one this morning already, and we're trying to kind of build up a a bank, a few episodes, do some inventory because, you know, it's, uh, we're in the summer months now. We got some uh, probably some vacations lined up and then we get into fall and it's a pretty hectic season with some of the major events that we have going on then. Yeah, like we talked about in the very first introduction episode that we did some of the some of the different segments we're going to try to cover. So this morning's episode was for the for a Beagle related episode for me. So that was interesting. So yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so uh, having those different segments is going to help. And and the good thing about some of these episodes that we're taping is they're not as time sensitive. Uh, uh, and if we were to do one about some of the major events coming up, we can always push and, uh, stuff around. So that'll be handy to have in our back pocket. Yeah. And it's, it's been a lot of fun. I'm having fun with it and I know you are as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing that we're getting a lot of feedback on is, is rule interpretations and us talking about those. And I think people really appreciate it. Uh, we got more coming out on the episode today towards the tail end of it. We'll talk about, uh, uh, kind of the procedure for calling timeouts and then, uh, the babbling rule that is, is always highly discussed at any event you go to. Yeah. Sounds good. You know, going back to a little bit of the feedback, one guy mentioned, you know, we do write a lot of things, the advisor column that you now write. Uh, the one guy really made a good point. And I think a lot of guys are like that. Now they can listen to some of those articles or listen to these podcasts talking about rules while they're driving. Yeah. Makes, and a, makes a lot of good sense. Having both of us having wrote those columns, obviously you've been writing them for, uh, 15, 20 years now, uh, it sure is easy to discuss it and kind of talk about it rather than try to get that interpretation through in writing can sometimes be difficult. Yeah, you can get more in depth, I feel like. That's right. Yeah. So, and actually today on the podcast, we're going to start out talking about a couple of our uh, more successful newer programs uh, today, which we're going to talk about a little bit about the Tournament of Champions. Here we're at the halfway point. We're about halfway through the year now. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the top 10 bench show program. That's uh, a, an old program, but uh, has a, a facelift recently with uh, some money added to it. And we're going to talk about some of the specifics. And one thing I'm excited about today is we're going to talk about some dogs, some leading dogs in both of those, in both of those programs. Perfect. I like that. Yeah. So diving right into the tournament of champions here at the halfway point, like I said, we're about halfway through the year. Obviously there's some uh, uh, event reports are always a, a week or two behind. So we're not exactly halfway there on that scale. But uh, we're we're getting there, and uh, uh, right now we we are publishing a list of qualifiers. So if you are heading for uh, the tournament champions, trying to get qualified for that, you can always find that information, and it's available on our website. I actually, update that every other Tuesday, just to get it out every other Tuesday morning. I update that on our website, so it's it's pretty new, and it's something that uh, is fresh for you to check and and keep tabs on your dog and make sure the information's out there. Yeah, and that's obviously based on the reports that we've received and processed both. And oftentimes, you know, that's a good insert right here is probably uh, we can't process your event reports until we've received them. You know, so most clubs, 90% of the clubs are good about saying them in right away. Uh, but we have that 10% that uh, we kind of have to stay after to get their re uh, results in. And when clubs don't send them in in a timely manner, when it gets to be 10 days, two weeks, sometimes even longer than that, then uh, these folks can't get their due credit and up in the standings uh, like we'd like to see them. So this is a good time to encourage clubs to, hey, it's just important to get your reports in. It's also a good time to give some kudos to the to the girls in our department who do a bulk of this paperwork, Amanda, uh, Morgan, and Lacey. Uh, they're going to stay up to date on getting those done. So if your dog's supposed to be on that list and it's not, then there's one of two things wrong. There's a problem on the report or we don't have the report yeah. because oftentimes those reports are up to date. Yeah. The other good thing with them, they are they are very up to date. 
they're staying within what uh, a day or two a day of or processing two that reports in. that come yep. in. So they're doing a great job with with staying on top of everything. Right. So uh, besides that being on our website, every other two are publishing it every a new list every other Tuesday. Also, it'll be in uh, each monthly magazine of Coonhound Bloodlines. And we do a lot of sharing of this program on our social media platforms on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you look for us at. So be sure to check that out. Yeah. So now getting to the to the meat of it here. Uh, right now, as of this or as of June twenty eighth, which was the latest compilation date, uh, three hundred and thirty seven dogs are qualified for the TOC currently, which is uh, pretty close to the pace that we were on last year. I think yeah. five or six dog difference there. Yeah. Um, right now we'll do a little bit of a breed and a sex breakdown, uh, just so people know, uh, black and tans, there's 19 of them qualified at this time. There's no leopards qualified. Um, we usually at least have a few, so we can expect to get a few qualified, but right now we're at zero, uh, 28 blue ticks are qualified at this time. 54 English hounds, two plots, six red bones, 212 walkers and 16 X spreads. Yeah, so qualify, that means those have a minimum of five cast wins, that many different dogs. Yeah, yeah. that's good, really. Since January 1st, yeah. not bad. Yeah. You know what's interesting to me? Look at this is the x 16. They're competing with, they're at, they're in the middle of the pack here. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're on black and tan's tails there, and there's there's way less of them. Yeah. That's kind of impressive. But So that makes 337 total, 185 males and 152 females. So almost yeah. split right down the middle there. You, you know, two. I always like to see that split. Back in the old days, males dominated this night hunt sport. You look at the world hunt numbers and things like that, males dominated but in these in this day and age, females are right up there. And I forget what our numbers were for the world hunt last year. I think maybe it might have been the TOC where we actually had quite a few or we had more males than females. But when it comes down to the semifinals and all that, look at how those females rose up. Evens out. It really does. Yeah. It really does. Very a, competitive. A yeah. And we're going to talk about some uh, a quality female here in a minute when we get to our highest cast winners of the year, I think. But uh yeah, for, first we're going to touch on uh, the states that are our top performing states so far. Right now, as we far have as quali dogs qualified, dogs qualified currently. Yeah, yeah. So right now, there's 28 different states have dogs that are qualified for the TOC that's, already. That's good. Yeah, that's good. 28 different states. 28 different states. Yeah. yeah. And actually, at right now, Missouri is leading all the states with 29 qualifiers on their own, um, which is a little surprising to me. It, it shouldn't be entirely surprising because they were they were in the top five in both 2020 and 2021 or right outside the top five uh but leading the way this year i wonder if that pace can sustain itself yeah uh, yeah uh second is ohio with 27 qualifiers which another one that's always in the top two or three and kentucky who was our top qualifying state the past two years in 2020 and 2021 is coming in third this year with 26 qualifiers yeah did it kind of surprise you that they led the way qualifying dogs the past couple of years um uh, you not really. Yeah. Be, yeah, not really, to be honest. They 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 have there's there's a lot of clubs that are That's having right. a lot of events, you know. So yeah. And 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 uh so I'm not not really surprised to yeah. see that. No. If I was betting on it, I probably would have took Indiana and Ohio. So it did surprise me in that. But you're right, there's a lot of clubs in Kentucky. Yeah, there is. Um and like was Indiana came in uh, fourth year with twenty three qualifiers and North Carolina rounds out that top five with twenty. Yeah. Three. Three states here tied at 19, just outside the top five. Yeah, so I'm not surprised to see that top five, North Carolina, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, Missouri. No, That's right. Not really. Yeah. No. Top performance states usually across the board, yeah. it seems like. so. Yeah, and then, you know, Tennessee is probably close behind there. looks like uh, – yeah, not too far behind there, but yeah. Tennessee, and then that's the eastern half of Tennessee. There's not a whole lot or a whole lot in the western half of the state, but the eastern half is pretty saturated with clubs. Yeah, we've kind of talked about this before with the world championship going out in West Tennessee. It's almost an untapped territory for us. There's not a lot of it UKC is. traction out that way. Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right about that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, and it's just opposite. Yeah. We talked about that in the last one. How flat it's going to be in Dyersburg, where the where the um, world hunt's going to be. Yeah. But where we have our saturated or the area saturated with clubs are in the hills. That's exactly right. Hills yeah. and steep stuff. It seems backwards. It's kind of odd. But yeah, it's a really East Tennessee is a really strong place for, for sure clubs, is. and sure there's is. a lot of hunters in that area. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm excited about this. Talking about some of the top cast winning dogs so far this year in the list of qualified dogs. Um, I saw that of the uh, 337 qualified dogs, 19 of them currently have 10 or more wins um, as of this June 27th update. Yeah. You know, it's it's this is very interesting to me because before we had this TOC, when we looked at just to to 
look at try to see what kind of number we might expect as far as dogs with five cast wins. We ran a query, so that would have been in 2019. I think it was the 1st of October, might have been sometime in September, ran a query to see how many dogs at that time would have had five cast wins. Right. And what we're now getting with this program, astronomical. Far, far, far more dogs with that number of cast wins as opposed to them at, or at that time. Yeah. Huge, huge difference. I remember some of those early conversations where we discussed that. that yeah, and that's why, you know, based on that, my calculation was the first year we might get 500 dogs qualified. And I was hoping for a few more. Look how far off I was. Yeah, you were. But it, this just uh, it just goes to show what this program has actually done for the increase in those number of dogs getting those wins. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, here again, you have the numbers to show that. Yep, that's right. Numbers to back it up. Yeah, so let's get into some of the top cast winning dogs this year. We actually have a tie for for first in cast wins. And that's let's uh, remind again, these are for reports that have been processed so far. There's Some of these dogs are going to have more wins than we know of at this time currently but this is uh as of this recording and what events have been processed yeah it's not like we're making it a competition or anything like that but it's good to recognize some of these dogs that have uh, that are doing a lot of winning out in yeah. ukc events right now yeah and this platform gives us a great opportunity to highlight dogs and, yeah and owners yeah. and handlers yep. yeah so the first one here is a uh, grand knight champion two roberts backwoods quinn she's a five-year-old tree and walker female owned by jason roberts of south carolina and she has 14 cast wins so far that's crazy records. yeah Jason, uh, I honestly, I didn't know of the dog before Grand American this year, but I sure do now. It seems like every event I go to, she's there and and competing, and and she's running some different races and 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 is doing a great job. This this is a female out of uh, Night Champion Randall's Backwoods Juice and Night Champion Backwoods Ziva, uh, over on the East Coast, I would assume. But uh, she had double cast wins at Grand American, made it to the final cast, and got third over third third overall there. Um, then, uh, the next month she was at the winter classic where she got a cast win on Saturday night. Uh, she was in the final four of the winter classic slam on Thursday night. And then just a couple weeks later at Southeastern tree and Walker days had triple cast wins. And on Thursday night, she was actually the Allen shoe Memorial hunt winner, which oh, is yeah. a big honor in their, yeah. in their association. Yeah. And a, a lot of wins and a lot of them at some of those major events. That's right. Of the 14 we looked at, all of them are at major events. I mean, our other ones, double cast wins at the South Carolina hall of fame, uh, double cast wins at blue tick days, double cast wins at English days and, uh, some single cast wins at Georgia state hunt. Uh, yeah. And qualif as qualified for the world championship at, yeah. at the Hall of Fame hunt in South Carolina there. And a little, uh, I guess, a little tease here is that she's going to be the only female here in our top five cast winners so far oh, yeah. this year. Um, so, and actually, uh, the, the second dog here that's tied for first with 14 cast wins is a dog, Grand Knight Champion 4, Trusties King Rolo. This is a dog where I ran the list earlier today and had the owner of the dog call in and was wondering about this because they're running for the Grand Knight Champion Hall of Fame title that we have for a dog that accrues that many wins towards uh towards that title yeah that's and, a dog that comes out of indiana comes out of rochester indiana that's right. they're close to jason smith who was a trusty uh not adam but uh, one of those trusty Garrett. boys but yeah one of those trusty yeah. boys had that dog down here but yeah and they did quite a bit of winning with him here yeah, yeah. so now uh garrett or uh, drew and uh jamie Eastep in west virginia uh on these dog drews running him up and down the road and they're really set on making this dog grand night champion yeah. hall of fame and with 14 cast wins this year, uh, 26 grand wins total. They're just, uh, uh, in our records, 11 shy of making it to the, the Grand Night Champion Hall of Fame, and we're actually missing four more that haven't came in from this past weekend. Oh, yeah. yeah. So going to be adding a few more to this dog's record before it's all over. I think they want to make him a Grand Night Champion Hall of Fame before Autumn Oaks rolls around. Yeah, Drew's one of those kids that's just ate up with hunting or whatever, put a decent dog in his hands, and he'll, he'll, he'll make it happen. He'll uh, put the time in, that's that, for sure. That's right. I see he he did have double cast wins at Winter Classic, and they're actively making a run for the Triple Crown, too, so we can expect to see this dog uh, competing at Autumn Oaks, and the dog's also qualified for the world. And yeah. I think he's going to be going to the Pennsylvania zone. But I had, talking to his dad, Jamie, who's actually a field rep for us in there in West Virginia, I was talking to him just a little bit ago, right before we got on here, and he says, I can always tell when uh, Drew and Rolo are going to go on a roll here because his uh, – the background on his phone changes from his girlfriend at the time to Rolo, <laughs> him and Rolo. So yeah. that's when you know he's got his head on straight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving right along here, we got a few dogs here tied for third with 13 cast wins on the year. Uh, first one to be Grand Knight Champion uh, Honeycutt's Balling Buck, a four-year-old tree and walker male owned by Steve Honeycutt of Missouri. Uh, of the 13 wins, I show he had four double cast wins at double headers this year. 
Um, and, and one thing that's interesting to me is that we you oftentimes see dogs with a lot of cast wins in the state of Missouri. And I think federation that's because points. of the federation points. Yeah, they, that's a big thing out there. That's right. Actually, one of the first assignments I had when I came to work here was an article about the Grand Night Champion Hall of Fame title that just came around. And I was, we had two dogs that had that had attained that title before it ever came around. They're both from the state of Missouri. Yeah. Martin Hardy Jr. with a female named Katie and Gary Potts with a, a male dog named Sam I Am. And they were both uh, actively running for Missouri Federation Coon Hunt uh, yeah. multiple years in a row. Yeah. And that's where they racked up all those wins at. Yeah, that program in Missouri has really worked out well for a lot of those clubs have been able to benefit from it. People chasing those Missouri points and they go to all, most most all of the clubs have the Missouri Federation points, I do believe. Yeah. Or at least they used to. And that's probably a reason that Missouri is, is always a, a top producing yeah. state as far as yeah. numbers goes. Yeah, yeah. They put a lot of effort and thought into that. Yeah. Uh, also tied for third is going to be, with 13 wins, is going to be Grand Night Champion Canada Runs Blue Bjorn. That's a three-year-old blue tick male owned by Kevin Clark of Pennsylvania. There's a little color in the top. Yeah, this is actually the lone non-walker that'll uh, be here in this uh, top five. Uh, and uh, let's see, he's out of Dark Leon's Dark Side, which is a kind of a top producing blue tick right now. Dog out of Pennsylvania. Him. That's right. He's uh, doing a lot of uh, making a lot of noise as far as reproducing goes in the blue tick breed. Uh, Bjorn, I'm not really familiar with him or his his owner, but I saw that he had three. He's uh, accrued wins in three different states this year: Pennsylvania, New York, and Maryland. And he's qualified for our world championship. And it yeah. sounds like he has a a zone right there in his home state this year. Yeah. Uh, moving down the list here, last one tied for third with 13 wins is going to be Grand Champion, Grand Night Champion Watley Stroker. This is a two year old tree and walker male owned by Mark Watley of Texas. Always interesting to me when I see a person from Texas on this list. Because they just don't have a lot of clubs and opportunities in that state to rack up wins. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like we said about the uh, one a couple back is that th is this is a dog that's capitalized on double headers this year. He's doubled up four different times at double headers, uh, three of those being at the, at his Queen City Club where he also qualified for the world. Yeah, that's where the zones are going to be this fall. So that's right in his home. I home wouldn't want to. Right I wouldn't want to draw him if I yeah. went to Queen City. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And uh, we got a couple, just a couple here tied uh, for the fifth place with 12 cast wins each. And that's uh, one would be Grand Night Champion Anthony's Late Night Romeo. It's a one year old tree and walker male owned by Josh Anthony of Louisiana. Another one, a Louisiana. Not a lot of, not a lot of uh, opportunities or clubs in their state uh, to hit the road um, as much as some of the more congested parts of the, of the country. Uh, but I see all his cast wins become in Louisiana. Uh, and uh, he's doubled up at double headers five times. So when he he shows up, he's there to win. Looks like yeah, yeah. And there again, those double headers are just that they fit right into this the whole TOC program. Yeah. And people are taking advantage of it. The hunters are taking advantage of it. Clubs are taking advantage of it. It's been a good thing those double headers and yeah, you're seeing a lot of these good dogs take advantage of it and winning both of them. That's absolutely right. And you have to do that if you live in a state like Texas or Louisiana to be on this list. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and the last one we're going to highlight today is going to be the, the last one tied for fifth place with 12 cast wins is going to be Grand Night Champion, Champion Coming in Clutch. Another one-year-old tree and walker male that's owned by Rick Gravid, Gravetti of Missouri. Um, looks like this dog had a cast win at Winter Classic, and uh, the other 11 wins that the dog has on its record were all in Missouri, where, of course, probably the Federation's coming into play again. And, and probably if you looked, I don't know what their standings look like, but probably one of the dogs that's up there in the Missouri Federation standings, obviously, Absolutely. we would have record of those most cast wins. Absolutely. And right here, we're also showing that, uh, the, uh, well, I just made note here that the dog got its second registered win back in early January. So starting out with one win this year, and it's finished to Grand Night by May 20th. So oh, the dog wow. was consistently winning. Yeah. Better, better to recheck that dog's name, Coming in Clutch. might be a name we all, we'll see a whole lot more of by, uh, by that record. Yeah, that's right. So the TOC list is there on our website for everybody to look at. I did, I did uh, do some searching around today to, to look at some of the top dogs on this list. And just so everybody knows, all three finalists from last year's 20, or from this year's uh, TOC finals are actually already qualified for next year. Connor McGregor, Piper, and Dominator are all on the list to compete next year. Already. Yeah, you know, and that's uh, that's you know, obviously the, this year's uh, uh, TOC with the regions and the finals, they accru accrued several cast wins, obviously. So the most of those is what already got them qualified for next year. 
Which goes to uh, goes to my next thing is Bill Stover had called here a while back wanting to know if they get a dog that with the winner, the eventual winner of the TOC is always qualified like we do for our world hunt. And we talked about it and we decided they should be. Yep. But the other thing is really the winner is most of the time they're already qualified. They've got at least five cast wins at the regions, two at the regions if they get two, even one. And now either uh, three or four cast wins at the finals yep. is going to give them their five. But in either in either case, we've decided they're always going to be qualified. But technically, they've they may be a win or two short at most, uh, as is. But they've put in the work. They won that yeah. the big one. That same yeah. thing we do for the world champion. Yeah. Whoever wins the world championship is is a is a straight shot to the zones and we're going to do the same thing for the toc finals. yeah so uh, bill stover if you're listening why butch is qualified for next year regardless right get, get your entry in yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right so now we're going to dive in a little bit to our top 10 bench show program which is a, a program that's been a, around for a long time but it kind of got a got revamped and got a facelift back in 2020 uh whenever we implemented the tournament champions and uh, some of the bench show folks were like, Hey, what about us? And yeah. so we ended up uh, putting some time and resources into it and to the tune of $15,000 that's paid out to the winners of the top 10. Yeah. And we program. already had the top 10 program in place, just didn't have that money, you know, before it was just kind of the prestige of it and had some special awards for those dogs. But so we didn't really have to change a whole lot. Well, actually, we didn't change anything as far as the program itself, just added the money to it. Yeah. It's a good deal. I'm glad we're able to do that. Yeah, and I think it ha it's breathes it's breathed some life into the bench show program. I think we're seeing an increase in numbers across the board for bench shows, and uh, I think it's making a big difference in in competition levels there. Yeah, yeah, and we have some clubs that are really taking advantage of the bench show programs, it, just because you have you don't have to have a night hunt with a bench show. All right. You know, we don't allow we don't allow. Uh, we don't schedule night hunts on Sundays, yeah. but you can have bench shows um, along with water races and field trials on on Sundays. And even in the winter months, we have several clubs that in the winter months they have Christmas shows. Yep. Uh, maybe when the weather is just not fit to be to be hunting, you can still have some shows and sometimes put a little effort into it. We have some clubs that are putting on some nice shows. Yep. They put a little effort in, and it's sure reaping the benefits of sure it with are. some really nice yeah. entries. Sure. Yeah, so a little bit about the Top 10 Bench Show Program. It's a year that runs from November 1st to October 31st the next year. Uh, we take that month of November and through December to uh, get in the rest of the, the end of the year reports, uh, finalize the standings, and get the get the point totals out there. And we'll start mailing out invitations to the Top 10 Bench Show Finals at the 1st of January, where the finals will be will be held in conjunction with the Winter Classic in Batesville, Mississippi. Middle of February. Middle of February. Yeah. Yep. Uh, similar to the uh, to the tournament champions qualifiers list, this uh, top ten bench show uh, standings is something that I do every other Tuesday morning, same morning, uh, on our website ukcdogs.com. If you go to the standings page, you can access a lot of different information there. It's a very useful tool for people. Here again, same thing based on the reports that we have received and that are processed. That's exactly right, uh, and same as uh, we talked about for TOC qualifiers list. Uh, this is also published monthly in Coonhound Bloodlines, and it's another one that we push pretty hard on our yeah. social media platforms. Yeah. So be sure that you're following along there to get all the, the latest information and news as it becomes available. Yeah, so a little bit about the point system for the top 10. Uh, it's uh, it's The points are accrued by dogs based on the number of dogs they defeat at a bench show mm -hmm. in, their, uh, in their category. Or yeah, class. categories being registered champions and grands, three different categories. Right. So our best male and best female a show, they're going to be awarded one point for each dog that they defeat in their class or Correct. in their category. Correct. So that's very simple math. If there, was, if there were six registered females in the show, that means the best female of show is going to accrue five points. Exactly right. Does uh, not get credit for their own entry, just number of dogs defeated. That's exactly right. One point per dog. Moving on to the champion division, champion male and female, they're actually going to get awarded three points per dog that they defeat in their class. And yeah, and one of the reasons for the point difference there, oftentimes your champion classes aren't as large as your registered male and female classes. So that's obviously one of the reasons why more points in the champion division. 
And as you continue to climb up uh, up the divisions and you title your dog out, uh, the grand champion male and grand champion female are going to be awarded four points for every dog they defeat in their class. Yeah, again, it bumps it up a little bit. And then there's sometimes that it, in that class at the local level, especially, there might not be that many grands to show up. But we're see, actually seeing more grands showing at the local level because of this program here. So uh, there's also some points if you are – uh, in the grand division, if you didn't defeat any, and that's what two points. You get two points if you're the only grand champion there, and you win the category. Yeah, so. so that doesn't even if you're the only one, you're still going to get some points. Right, not as many as you would if you had defeated somebody. But now that's not true in the in the champion division. Uh, only grand champion. Only that's the, the only grand division champion division where division. you can get yeah. points for defeating no dogs. Yeah, if you are the only champion, you're not going to get any top ten points. That's or exactly. the only registered dog, you're not going to get a point. And the points are going to carry over as you move from uh, division to division. It's just one set point total, and it'll stick with you for the in, for the duration of the series year. Yeah, and what you mean by that is if you start out as a registered point, say you gained or you earned ten register points, top ten points while you were registered, they carry with you, and whatever you get in champions, it just adds on to that ten points. Just one point tally yeah. keeps on building. Yep. New and, set of points every year. And there's actually no no tiebreakers in this event. So any dogs that at least tie for 10th place move on. We don't oftentimes see that, but it, it does happen. It does. It, it does, does happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, moving on to the finals a little bit, which, man, we've put a lot of thought and effort into the into the top 10 finals, and it's actually turned into a— So much we've even had Todd Kellum up in a cage running lights up there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. And this this kind of went from a mid-Friday show kind of stuck between registered and kid show to kind of a standalone— Friday evening show with uh, stadium seating and low lights, and uh, we we do a lot of uh, videoing and and uh, advertisement for it, and even get some food out there for them, some advertisers and appetizers and finger foods and stuff for yeah. for anybody who makes it in. So yeah. we try to make it feel like it's a big deal because it's probably one of our bigger bench shows. And of it the is year. a big deal. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so it's been a lot of fun too. It has been. And some of the dogs you see in that competition is. It's up there. A lot of the events that we put on, uh, minister ourselves, like Autumn Oaks and the world, I, I oftentimes miss a lot of those shows, uh, especially Autumn Oaks. You're, you're busy all day long with stuff. You don't yeah. have time to sit and watch the show. And at the world, you're up all night on Friday night and you roll in on Saturday dragging and you have a lot of responsibilities to do to get ready for that night. Uh, so being able to actually see some of the top uh, show dogs in the country compete is always fun to do on that Friday night. Yeah, that's uh, it's always it's always been the same way for me. You work in the hunt office, you yep. know, and you don't get to see a lot of the show stuff. So yeah, you're right. Yep. Yeah. So uh, basically, how it works is we're going to invite the top ten dogs of each breed at the end of the series, and they're gonna the ones who uh, enter up and come show are going to be first split up by their breed, uh, regardless of the title they've accrued, their age or the sex. They're all going to show against each other against their breed first. And they're going to get judged by a three-judge panel uh, for us to pick a winner on that. The three-judge panel is something that you started back at some shows earlier on, right? Yeah, we did. And it was one of the series events that we had, the national championship. We had that. And and it's worked quite well, really. You know, so we carried that over to this uh, to this top 10 and used that three-panel format uh, where we have each judge just gives the dog a score. And they, they add those three scores together. And that's the dog's each dog's score. It's worked. Very well, actually. It has worked very well. It's always interesting to me to look at the judges' tal or scores after it's all over and how consistent they are across the board. The judges yeah. that we've selected have always done a really it's good actually job some, at this. It's actually something we adopted from UKC's all breed shows at, at their premiere. They did, that's how they judged the top ten. Yeah. So we kind of adopted that same uh, format and carried it over, and it's and it's worked quite well. Yeah. It's like anything new that that first year we did it. You know, there was a lot of apprehension you know this isn't going to work well or what, what if we do this or that but it it has worked quite well that's right and it it has a good feel to it each judge has their own ring there'll be three separate rings there the first mm -hmm. dog will come in the first ring gate and uh, bench the dog and then move on to the next one for the next evaluation and it runs really smooth to the end of the first rounds over and all seven breeds are done and all the points are tallied to get the breed winners. yeah and it is a different show dogs aren't used to and handlers aren't used to showing in that format usually they go up and show on one bench and you know get evaluated by one judge along with the rest of the class this is this is definitely different. They're in ring one for this judge. They gate, they put stack their dog up, they show their dog, move down, move to ring two. Right after that, do the yeah. same thing down to three before they're done. So it's different. Yeah. And you're oftentimes working the mic during that show. And yeah. after everybody's done showing and you announce the 
the breed winners. There's a lot of anticipation in the air. It's yeah, pretty exciting. It is. Yeah. It is. And it's they, a fun show. If they win their breed, they're guaranteed two thousand dollars and moving on to the to the finals, the show against the other breed winners. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty good payout for them. So um, after with the seven breed winners have been selected and announced, we usually uh, open we open up the ring for just one big ring, have all all three judges in the same ring, and at that point they actually reevaluate each dog all at once, so they don't have to go in three separate rings again now. Yeah, and I love that the they first get year we didn't do that, but this last year yeah. we decided to do that, and it worked better. Yeah. so we're probably going to stick with that. That's right, and I love the fact that the dogs get reevaluated because these are people out there judging these dogs with a score and i feel like after you've seen every dog that's in the show your scoring system is going to be uh, on point at that after you've seen every dog that's in yeah. you're going to be able to say your scale yeah. pretty well at mm -hmm. that point yeah so uh this will be our third top 10 uh since we've started doing the cash payouts and the last two were actually both won by uh, uh the dog county line tuesday's legacy uh owned by christina officer and susan ragsdale ragsdale a plot female uh who's done a lot of winning the past couple of years world show champion now she won auto Mokes national grand grand champion uh she's always a tough out yeah the first time i remember seeing that dog was at the world championship finals in iowa 2019 i think it was 2019 it yep. was your first world championship that's correct yep so we set up the ring and she was we wanted to make sure we had our everything was big enough so i remember nicole our event coordinator uh she wanted to take a dog and just gate it around or whatever. And yeah. she took that dog, happened to be that dog. We asked Christine if she had a dog we could borrow just to make sure everything's good here with our ring and everything. And so Nicole played with that dog a little bit. And after it was all done, she told me, that is a good dog. Now, would look been, what, she would have been young then. Yeah, she was really young yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know though, I don't know what she did. I don't remember what she did there at that show. But since then, wow, she's made a name for herself. Well, I do know a plot dog won that show. That was Dibs and Wayne Steele that oh, won yeah. that first year. It was. So it was. Some tough competition in the plot breed yeah. always at those shows. Yeah, but that was, I thought that, I always remember that because Nicole told me after, that is a good dog. We're going to jump into uh, the standings right now. Just uh, highlight a couple of the dogs that are leading their breeds at this time. I will say Legacy is, she is uh, running fifth currently in the plot breed. So watch out if she gets through. She's <laughs> she's tough to beat there yeah. under the lights. Yeah. Uh, so first we'll start out with Black and Tans. Uh the high dog in this in this breed is actually uh, Grand Champion Two Melrose Mountain. Lead me home with 122 points. That's uh, not Lisa a shocker. And Shane is Bettingfield. It? Not a shocker at all, is it? It's a black and tan. That's one all over the country. Uh, reserve World Champion a couple years ago was reserve at Grand American this year. Actually, um, the tough female. Yeah. And only actually only three. Uh, she hasn't been shown very much this year. Three category wins this year, and. Uh, has 122 points racked up. So yeah. she's beating a lot of, or the shows that she's winning are high level events. Yeah. Well, the one thing with, uh, with the other black and tan folks, they don't need to worry about, uh, needing to compete with this dog at the next show where they're going to get a lot of the winners going to get a lot of points. That's autumn Oaks. That's right. Lisa will actually be judging. So this dog will be out. Yeah. And actually right now, just, uh, for anybody who's running the top 10, 28 points is the cutoff for black and tan. So there's a lot of opportunity there for moves and shakes throughout the rest of the year. Yeah. Uh, and there's big points available for Autumn Oaks and uh, obviously the World Championship as well. Be a couple more plot days is coming up, you yeah. know, so there's still some opportunities for sure. Yeah. For big points, a lot of points. That's right. Some of the, obviously, just because of the bigger numbers, bigger entry numbers, the more dogs defeated, the winners are going to get a bunch of top 10 points. Yeah, moving on to Leopard Hounds. Right now, the high dog is, with 47 points is Confirmation Champion, Grand Champion 3, Soap Creek, Mr. Moose, Spot. It's, which is another title owned by Chuck and Lucas Slattery. Um, they're down in Tennessee right now. This That's is kind a, of a new name that I've not, yeah. I don't really know those guys that well, but I've, I, uh, I announced the show at the winter classic yep. this last year and they were there and they had several dogs they had in the show. And so, That's uh, right. And they're, they're, it's a father son duo. The son has to be, I don't know, 12, 13. I'm not really good at gauge and age, I guess like that. But, uh, they're running around all over. They've been all over the country this summer too. Is ones that I see a lot of different places and that, and we see them. Their dogs on event reports coming in here. That's so, yeah. exactly right. Yeah, of the forty-seven points, I show eight champion wins and sixteen grand champion wins in this cycle. So yeah. they're getting around and they're doing a lot of winning. Yeah. So and this is a result of that top yeah. of the standings in the top ten for their breed. Exactly right. And uh, uh, the top, the low, the point total to get into the top ten for leopard hounds right now is just twelve points. So you can get that in a couple shows. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Blue Ticks, uh, high dog right now. Grand Champion 2, Rockin' W Surround Sound, owned by Whitney and Debbie Killo. 
188 points right now. Yeah, I believe that's the dog she calls Dolby. I that's think correct. It, yeah, um, the her dogs have won all over the country. I remember when she won. The first time I saw her was at Columbia City. Um, I can't even tell you the year it was. I'm going to say it was 2008, nine ish somewhere in there. I could be way off. Oh. But I'd never met her before, never heard of her before. Here's this young lady from Oklahoma, uh, is new, and she comes in and wins the whole world show. <laughs> and it's like you know, just comes in and makes her mark, and and hasn't uh, hasn't slowed down since. She's and has bred a lot of nice blue ticks that have won all over the place. They're getting people are buying into that breeding, and and you're seeing a lot of that. Yeah. Well, just some of her major wins this year: Grand Champion Male at Winter Classic, which is a hard show to win. Uh, grand champion male at Tennessee State, Arkansas State, both days at Blue Tick Days. And when she shows up with Dolby, they're going to be tough to beat. Yeah. Um, English Coonhounds, uh, high dog right now. Grand champion sideshow Bobby Sue, Jacob Brooks. They have 115 points. This young duo, young dog and a, a young young handler. Yeah, he's just he's a junior handler. That's right. And comes from a Walker family, treeing Walker family. For some reason, he is he's uh, he's veered off sideways a little bit but he prefers these english hounds i guess well i just saw him at english days uh, uh, uh last month and uh i think they're almost converted from what i hear really the yeah. whole family <laughs> they they had a lot of english dogs there so i asked them what in the world was going on yeah. there but i guess uh, she doesn't uh she does not sure where she went wrong in, in uh, raising them but they're both showing uh off colored walker dog or Non Walker dogs, I guess I should say. Yeah, and I, I'm not. Don't quote me, but I think this dog comes from Mike Seats. That's right. Does it? Yeah. It's from the Bobby Lou dog that he did so go. much winning with. There you go. And actually, we were just at English Days, and uh, and this dog here, and uh, this the Bobby Sue dog, was able to win the Thursday uh, Vicky Hill Memorial Queen of Show at oh, that, yeah. and then won overall Queen of Show at yeah. English Days. And boy, was he tickled. Yeah. So here, last uh, in one of our episodes that we recorded here a week or two ago, we were talking a lot about the youth handlers youth programs and jacob is one of those he can't be more than what he's probably still a junior is he not 11 12 13 uh, he's probably like 14 15, is he so okay yeah. so he's maybe a little older than time time flies here but not, nevertheless top of the standings for uh, english hounds yep amazing and he's competing with guys like mike seats yeah that's Crazy. exactly right yeah yeah so on to our plot hounds uh right now confirmation champion grand, grand champion rag mountain sweeter than honey Owned by Katie and Jason Woodward. Right now they have 89 points and they're leading the plot breed, which is always a competitive breed. Yeah, that's and that's a very nice dog there. I saw that dog last year in West Virginia at the plot, uh, what was it, Some a, a big plot hunt there in West Virginia. Uh, yeah, um, big game nationals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was there at uh, Jamie Estep's club. Uh, but I was the judge one day and that dog was in my lineup and that's a very nice dog. That's right. Very, very nice dog. And another dog that's won at some pretty big events this year. Let's see, uh, just finished out the grand champion, actually, uh, midway through the cycle. So uh, won, uh, obviously qualified for the world at RQE, won champion uh, female both days at uh, AP, at the American Plot Association days. Virginia State, she won champion one day and grand champion the next when she moved up a level. And then she was all the way over in uh, Ohio at uh, Blue Tick days and won uh, grand champion female there both days. Yeah. It's a nice dog. Uh, then we'll move on to Red Bones, where the high point dog of the whole race is. Uh, that's Grand Champion 2, uh, Ruby Grand Champion, uh, Skyline's Push My Luck, owned by Beth Jenkins, and she has 382 points right wow. now. Wow. Wow. I don't know if I've ever heard of that. 382? Yeah. Right right now, just going through the list of wins, uh, Grand American Major Winter events. Classic, that's why. Georgia State, Peach Classic, Alabama State, National Red Bone Days, American Red Bone Days. Virginia State, Tree and Walker days. Uh, the list goes on and on. I, I know what we oftentimes talk about dogs getting hot. Uh, like a lot of people were talking about Dominator going into the tournament champion finals this year. How dogs get hot in the hunt and it kind of carries over. And every time you see them, they're winning at a hunt. But I've seen this happen in the shows too. Just re, just since I've been here the past few years, dogs like uh, the Wendy dog that Natalie Atkins was showing, then Dibs with Wayne Steele, who uh, Grand American World Finals and uh, Winter Classic. And then, of course, Christina the Officers with multiple Winter Classic wins, top 10, uh, Autumn Oaks World Championship. Yeah, and I don't know how old this dog is, uh, but, you know, sometimes when you, where you see that some of the younger dogs that may be at two years old uh, just kind of really growing into themselves, not fully developed yet, maybe by the time they're three and four, is it's just uh, 
know, they just fill out and just uh, get on a roll like that. And I would guess that this dog is probably in that in that age age bracket somewhere without without knowing for sure. But you're right. She goes to a lot of shows, but she sure is winning a lot and against a lot of nice dogs. And the last breed, of course, is the uh, the Tree and Walker with champion Laurel Valley Boondock Bombshell owned by Kelly and Dave Myers. They have 111 points right now uh, with just a couple wins. The one champion at Winter Classic, and if you win at a major event like that, uh, you know you're going to make a big jump in the standings. And then they had a champion win at Black and Tan Days and then an RQE. But one thing that I, I failed to mention on a couple of these is that it's a, the point totals at the bottom of the standings are really attainable for dogs, and there's still a lot of opportunity and room for movement here with some major events still yeah. on the schedule. And we're going to see some shuffling. Yeah, and it's hey, congratulations to Kelly Myers. You know, Kelly and Dave. Uh, Dave shows a lot of the black and tans. Dave's yeah. a big walker guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't say that too loud. But no, Kelly's an ex. She's another one of those good handlers. You know, not surprised. She's done a lot of winning and, and has some very nice dogs. Not surprised to see that. It'd be interesting to see how it shakes out the rest of the year. Guess it's time to get to the rule discussion a little bit this uh, on this week's episode. Uh, we're getting a lot of feedback on our rule interpretations. I think people are really appreciating them, so I think this is perfect. Just like we knew, this is a perfect avenue for us to get information out to people. Uh, so the first one we're going to talk about this week is babbling. Oh, you picked that one for the first one? <laughs> <laughs> you're on your own here. Uh, one of babbling. the most one of the most uh, debatable rules that we have, probably babbling, but uh, nevertheless, it's good for us to cover it. I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there, and I think that we can use this platform here to kind of bury some of those and hopefully get out the correct interpretation so this rule gets applied correctly. Uh, so I will start out just by reading the rule real quick. Rule 2B in your rule books, if you're following along, uh, dogs declared struck and determined to be babbling shall be minus on strike. If there is any question when a hunting judge is used, the cast must vote immediately. It takes a majority of cast vote to minus. A tied vote results in deleted strike points. Yeah, and the definition of babbling is as simple as this. When a dog opens three times or has been struck where no track is evident. And you can find that right at the end of the running rules. You see the asterisk there by babbling in your rule book. Yeah. It, it denotes that there's a definition at the end of the running rules. Yeah, and, and that's where it shows that. There's out. six, eight, ten of those in the rule book. You'll see that that asterisk, and that's what it is. It means there's a definition for whatever that word is. In this case, babbling. You can find it at the end of the rule book. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so a lot of times whenever I'm talking to people about babbling, like you said, it's, uh, it's one that gets uh, discussed a lot. Um, there's a lot of opinions out there. It's it's like a lot of the rules in our rule book. It, a lot of it comes down to a judge with sound judgment and people in their cash using common sense and their knowledge that they've gained through hunting and being in hunts. Probably the one where the most the the most excuses are made for yeah. um, a babbling dog, you know. And I think a lot of people aren't fooled by it. Just don't you know not in don't want to debate it or argue it or what it, what have you. But uh, um, it can be a little frustrating, you know, to uh, when you have a babbling dog in the cast and they're essentially stealing strike points and this and this and that, you know, it does get frustrating for handlers, you know, but, uh, uh, the thing is there is a rule in place and it is as simple as that. You know, when a dog opens through times or has been struck where no track is evident, uh, make the call if you need to, if, and that's just for a dog that's declared struck, you know, um, personal experience. I can remember once or twice I've ever minus a dog for it, and I can one time I do remember um, didn't have much issue after it, and and the guy was very respectful of it after that. His dog did babble, and he just and and the dog would just babble for a little while, then it would shut up, like a lot of dogs do, right? You know, but he 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 tried to take advantage of it, and we, I didn't let him slide on it, and we didn't have a a, a lick of issues, you know, just. Uh, made the call and stuck with it. Don't know? oftentimes you find that uh, handlers like that are going to see what they can get by with, yeah, with that's the true. judge. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and you know, it's okay. It's a judgment call. You know, uh, guys can make all kinds of excuses. Well, you can't tell this or you can't, you know, da, 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 this and that. If you know, if you've been a houndsman long enough, y you get to know dogs. It's yeah. not always that hard yeah. to, you know, figure out if a dog's babbling or if it isn't, you know, um, and the thing is, it's a judgment call. And basically, you know, use common sense. And the knowledge you get from uh, this being one of them is just gained by hunting dogs. Yep. It's as simple as that. That's right. 
Yeah. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the phrases that we always hear whenever we're hearing people try to give us their interpretation or how they judge it in the woods is carrying the track out. Hear that all the time. Yeah. Where are you going to find that in our rule book? It carrying is not out listed the track. in our rule book. Yep. It is not. And I think it comes from, uh, from other registries may have that rule, but we do not in UKC. It's as simple as what we just talked about, you know? So, uh, you know, it's not a matter just because your dog, okay. I don't know how they've got it set up in some of the other registries or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about UKC's position on it based on our rules as they're written. Yeah. Um, just because you're carrying out the track doesn't mean you're babbling. You know, yeah. I could say a dog can, I've seen dogs that will babble for 200 yards. will never shut up. Yeah. You know, uh, I've hunted with a couple guys whose dog would strike on the way to the woods and continue going all the way to the, yeah, yeah. To the tree. It's impressive. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but that, and the other thing that we get quite a bit of that they get confused with is the one minute grace period. So every time you turn dogs loose, beginning of the hunt, and every time you turn a dog loose, they have a one minute grace period where they don't, where you don't have to strike your dog. You don't have to declare it struck, even if it opens. Right. Until that minute is up, then it's on or before the third bark. You now have to strike that dog. Now, that doesn't mean you can strike the dog in that minute grace period, but you're not required to. Right. But just because you don't strike the dog and now you wait until the minute's up doesn't change the fact, has nothing to do really whether it's now babbling or not. You know, if if it's now after the minute is up, uh, just because... It may have been babbling in here. Heck, it could still be babbling. That really right. doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Don't associate the two necessarily. The two get grouped together they often. Do. And they, they, do. they think the one minute and babbling are one rule in the same, but they're two completely separate entities. And the one minute rule just keeps you from having to strike your dog on a yeah. babble. And, you know, it's it's a rule and it's hard for, okay, what you get a lot of time. Well, prove it, prove it. I can tell you one thing is the rules don't ask you to prove it. Yep. All we ask is the judge makes, you know, is, is knowledgeable and has some experience yep. and just uses common sense. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, and, it, and it's basically that, basically that simple. I don't know how else yep. to put it. And it's one that guys do get frustrated over. I can tell you a little quick story here from a couple of years ago. I had a guy call, this was before you, so it's been three or four years ago. A guy called in and wanted to discuss the babbling rule. He said he had, uh, um, won't mention any names and it doesn't matter. But he, he said, well, I tell you how I handle it. So he said the first couple of turn looses that they had, they had two dogs in the cast were taking first and second strike, just opening right away. And they couldn't get a majority to get him minus, I guess. And he was, uh, the other guy was, compl- the fourth guy was complaining about it. And then finally about the third turn loose, he says he drives down this long lane, goes back to the woods and they park back there and they bring the dogs back up this lane, lead them up about 150 <laughs> yards up this lane. Yep. And he turns them around and says, all right, boys, let's flip them back towards the woods again. Yeah. And down the <laughs> lane, they go, both of them just open and babbling all the way down through there. He's like, hmm. They weren't they, barking when we were going this way. They right? sure couldn't smell that track walking <laughs> up on the lead, but now they can, huh? Yep. But he said that's, he was he was kind of, he just wanted to tell me that, you know, but he said, that's how I got him. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So this I, is, I a, never forgot that. to chuckle a little bit. Pretty better. good. That is yeah. a pretty good one. Yeah. Uh, this is another rule where, uh, if you're a judge, you make your best judgment on it using your knowledge. And if there's any issue with it, then that's why the procedures are in there to, to get the cast vote right away where it can determine a lot where it takes a, a majority of the cast to actually minus a dog for babbling. And if it ends up in a tied decision, then that's whenever you're going to just delete the yeah. strike points and yeah. uh, race that dog strike period. Yeah. Yeah. But no, you're exactly right. That whole carrying out the track thing and the, and the, uh, and the one minute grace period thing that, you know, you definitely need to debunk that misconception. The two don't, they don't go hand in hand. So. Another rule that we get a few calls about for interpretations is the procedures for calling timeout in the hunts. And I figured this would be a good time to talk about it and maybe dispel some of the misconceptions about the word interference that we hear so often as well. Um, so uh, rule, seven, or rule seven covers all about timeouts. There's five instances there that we outline that is a broad, away, a broad array of instances that I think can cover most any situation where you would need to call timeout when you're in the woods. Uh, so rule seven reads... Judge or majority of cast, if hunting judges used, may call timeout in accordance with the following. A, when dogs are getting on highway, trail onto posted land, 
or trail into a place where the dog is, or where there is danger to dogs or hunters. B. If dogs get with another group of dogs. C. In case of accident or sickness. D. When dogs are trailing out of hearing in different directions. Or E. After scoring dogs on tree and all remaining dogs are either on leash or declared treed, and cast decides to move to new location after all trees are scored, timeout may be called walking to remaining trees with scored dogs on leash. Um, in that instance, hunt time uh, will be called back in while you're shining the tree. And if the dogs that were declared treed or happen to leave, then the dogs on the leash will need to be recast. Yeah, I think most of those are very self-explanatory and very simple to understand. You know, dog or uh, D, uh, dogs trailing out of hearing in different directions. You do get that sometimes. If I have a dog way out in, uh, at 3 o'clock and another one way out at 9 o'clock, and you need to stay where you can hear, try to stay in the middle where I can hear and judge both dogs. And it wouldn't be fair for us to move to pick one of these dogs to try to follow them and walk out of hearing in the other one. So that's what that's for. If that's the case, the judge has the uh, authority just to call time. And they should, to be fair, and just call time out and gather up dogs. Uh, but then E is one we added after we had the no leash lock rule. So E is also, if you just read it word for word, it's pretty self-explanatory. That's right. I think probably uh, that's, I would encourage guys that have questions about that, just read it word for word. And I think it really explains a whole lot. But basically what it amounts to is with the no leash lock rule is if a cast decides they do need to move location, this is the rule that will get them or allow that to happen. That's right. So long as they have all dogs declared treat. Yep. And so in this case, you're not going, nobody's going to take this option. You're, if you have dog A, you're going to keep dog A on the leash. But what we can now do is, and we don't even have to handle the rest of these dogs. You're not required to handle the rest of the, the three dogs that are de, uh, declared treed. Before we're, you call timeout. Before you call timeout. Yep. We're just simply going to score your dog. Then we're going to call timeout to walk to dog B. We're going to score him, walk to dog C. Score. Uh, we're going to call time back in on, on dog B. On the, when we're shining, shining, shining the tree, yep. Yep. Gonna t and hunt time's going to be called back in as well. Right. We're going to, as soon as we're done shining, we're going to stop hunt time again, call time out. We're going to walk to uh, dog C and same thing with D. So, and it's pretty self or pretty self-explanatory. And as soon as we've got that done now, we've not wasted our hunt time. You've got your dog on lead and right. have the opportunity to turn loose. That will allow us to move to a new, uh, a new place. Exactly. But now there's one other thing with that. Where I'd have to look where somewhere the rule is also going to tell you in the event when you do this, in the event that a dog were to leave when you're doing this, let's say for instance, you've got, um, you're going from A to B during this time, let's say dog C on his tree, he hushes up and leaves. At that point, you have to t turn all dogs loose at that point then, or dog A anyways. And time is called and back in. Time is called back in. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And that's actually the last sentence of Rule Seven E. So if you want to, if you yeah. read that rule all mm -hmm. the way through, break it up there, you'll you'll get the exact uh, interpretation of it. Yeah, uh, very straightforward. But rule. again, it, again, this one is probably if you just read it word for word, it's pretty self-explanatory. Just slow it down a little bit, and I think it's I think it's an easy one to understand just as written. Yeah, yeah. Under so Seven E. So the biggest question, I guess, is what do you do your, with your points if you call timeout in accordance with Rule 7? So first, what do you do with your strike points? Yep. I'm going to refer to Rule 5F, which says delete points if judge has to call timeout in accordance with Rule 7. Yep, and we're talking about 7, Rule 7 here. So we're going to delete them. Anytime we call timeout, it's going to be Rule 7. Yep. And then uh, I think where the biggest misconception is and some of the issues come into play is in uh, uh, what do we do with the strike points, or sorry, for the tree points for a dog that's declared treed before timeout's called. We're going to score that dog, and that's where they make a mistake sometimes. I don't know all the registries have this same rule. In UKC, any dog that is declared treed prior to timeout being called, you score them. That's right. uh, that is... It's, uh, it's in a rule 11a which it has the header uh, scoring dogs uh, prior to arriving to tree yeah and there's a, a sentence in in that whole thing that says dogs declared within hunting time are eligible for scoring yeah it and it does i'm looking at it right here and is uh it, rule 11 scoring dogs has a a section a b section a section is prior to arriving at tree b is after arriving at tree and then c talks about split trees and then d is about recasting uh, but it's under 11A, about halfway down. Yep. Like you said, dogs declared treed within hunting time are eligible for scoring. Even if you called timeout, you still go score those dogs. 
and also it tells us there and that uh, when you're one, one other thing yeah, that's important to, and it's important to note is when you do call timeout you go back to to score this dog's tree during timeout hunting time is also that's you also got to use hunting time for that shine time that's exactly what i was going to say yep that's exactly what I was going to say. So, uh, so in the instance you call a timeout uh, and there's a dog, you get to a tree where a dog's been declared treed before timeout's called, and there's another dog in there that's treeing, but it's it's uh, treed but not declared treed. What do you do in that instance? Uh, I have here written uh, rule six F. Uh, most times, this dog's uh, points are going to be uh, deleted, right? Yeah, strike. But, we're talking about strike points are going to be deleted. Yep. And, and matter of fact, any dog, anytime you call timeout or yep. at the end of the hunt, any yep. dog that is not declared treed, rule of thumb is those strike points for any dogs, they're going to be deleted. Yep. And they're going to be treated like the dog was running regardless of whether it was or not. And yep. what I mean by that, a dog could technically be treeing, not called treed. That doesn't matter. That's a mute point. He will still get his strike points deleted, just like as if he were running still. That's right. But now you're talking about a dog again that is at the tree. We've called timeout. We're scoring a dog because we have to score this dog because it was declared tree before timeout is called, correct? That's right. Okay, we we want to be, it's a good one. We want to be very clear with this. Yes. Um. So that dog, again, it's going to have its strike points deleted. Right. Okay. And he was there treeing when you get there with this other dog, right? That's right. your question. Yep. And that's a good one. Yep. So in the situation where you're actually uh, in the in, scoring this tree and a dog comes in after the fact, same same thing. You're this dog's been declared treed before the timeout's called. You're scoring the tree, then a dog comes into you while you're scoring yeah, this yeah. dog's well, tree. Well, we have two eligible. we have two separate situations. So let's for to make sure we don't confuse anybody. Let's use a situation A. So we're sco we'll go in to score this dog. We get there. There's a second dog there that's not been declared treed. Right. Okay, he's going to have his strike points deleted just like we talked about, irregardless. Really, what it amounts to is if it's a, if it's a registered cast, that's all that matters. Right. Okay, because it's going to get his uh, nothing. But when it's a champion class, a uh, champion or a grand, it could be different because, and it's because of this. If there happens to be off game here, if it's, if it's scored as a circle or a minus or um, uh, even plus, uh, all that doesn't matter for this dog in question that's treeing but not declared treat in this situation. But what does matter is if it's off game. Right. And it's because of this rule here, should be under rule six, says this, uh, 6F, in champion division cast, dogs are scratched for running, treeing, or molesting off game. Off game must be seen in parentheses. Um, doing these things, running, treeing, or molesting off game during hunting time, including any timeout periods prior to the expiration of hunt time. There you go. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Hunt time hasn't expired. We've called timeout during the hunt, but we have to score this. We still have to score this dog that was declared tree before hunt time was called out. Um, so in that case, if there is off game found, that dog is still going to be scratched. We're talking about this dog treeing, but not declared treat. Right. That's the only time this dog is going to get a penalty and would. Um, and that's important to notate here. Yeah, very important. So that's rule 6F. Again, uh, in champion division cast for running, treeing, or molesting off game during hunting time, including any timeout periods prior to the expiration of hunt time. Right. This rule used to be where you could actually scratch a dog anytime under the authority of the judge, which was before the hunt, and the authority of the judge didn't seize until he turned the scorecard into the Master Hounds. So they, that meant even after hunt time was up, a dog could still be scratched. You know, hunt time could be up. You just Sometimes you'd see, and I've seen it happen, where a dog's after the hunt's over sitting through there and has got an a, a off game and gets scratched for it. Yeah. So, but, uh, so yeah, Rule 6F applies here. So, yeah, so basically the only situation where a dog is uh, not declared treed before a timeout's called, uh, the only time it's going to be liable is going to be if there's off-game entry in a champion division cast or a, a hunt under champion rules. Exactly. Now, the other scenario is really quickly would be what about the dog that comes in after you've arrived to this dog, and Rule 5B is going to apply to that dog, and he's going to get his strike points deleted no matter what. There's 5B pop popping up again. Yep, 5B, 5B, 5B.
Uh, real quick, we talked a uh, you you touched a little bit on Rule Eleven, and it's such an important rule in our rule book, and it's one to that any anybody going to a hunt should probably refreshers on because there's actually a lot of interpretations inside that rule. Uh, just to just to talk about a few of them, and we're going to talk about Rule Eleven in depth in future future episodes, I believe. But yeah. just just for a quick overcast or uh, overview for you to uh, think about and maybe give this uh, rule a extra glance before your next hunt. It talks about keeping time on trees and one dog cast. Keeping time on trees if all dogs are declared treed or handled. Uh, dogs meeting a dog or dogs meeting a handler off a tree. Uh, what do you do with your dog when you arrive at a tree? Shine time clarifications, split tree clarifications, recasting clarifications. There's a lot there to unload. Yeah. Uh, neither of us are naive uh, about this timeout rule and, and knowing that it uh, sometimes gets abused in night hunts and uh, timeouts are getting called whenever it doesn't meet the criteria or the situations that uh, are outlined in Rule 7. Uh, let's say me and you are hunting. There's Dogs are struggling with a track or something. Yeah, we, we're going to call time out and uh, try to delete our, our strike points and get away with it. But that's not how the rule reads. No, it does not. If, if you're, if you're trying to call time out uh, for a situation that doesn't warrant it and it aren't, isn't warranted per rule seven for timeouts. Uh, we might be in danger in that situation if they're struggling with the track, but it's not danger to dogs or handlers. It's <laughs> danger to our points maybe, but that's, that's right. It. Yeah. For rule C, you're going to minus the dog strike points. If you, uh, get the dog off track for something that's not outlined in, in rule seven for timeouts. And that says you're going to strike somebody minus for calling dogs right. off trail. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we've touched on a couple good rule clarifications here. We talked in depth about a couple of our uh, uh, newer uh, important programs in our coon hunting program. Um, and we have a lot of good stuff on tap for coming episodes. I know you and, uh, you and I and Todd, the vice president have been to a lot of autumn oaks and we're going to talk about them. Uh, so that's one of our next Coonhound episodes you're going to see coming out. And I'm really looking forward to that, but until yeah. then, we appreciate you listening to this one and I hope you enjoyed it and we'll get you on the next one. Thanks for listening to the UKC hunting ops podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and to like and follow UKC Hunting Ops on Facebook and Instagram.